Well, my name is, of course, Wilbur Ira Wright Sr. And my, I was born in Detroit, Michigan. And he said, the, the date of birth? <laughs> December 11, 1932. So Detroit is <clears throat> where you were born. Yes. And is that where you were raised? Yes, I grew up there. I was the youngest of six children. Mm. Everyone else in the family had been born in Augusta, Georgia. Mm. So they sometimes referred to me as the Yankee. <laughs> <laughs> and, and can you just tell us where did your like grandparents or however far back you want to go, where were they, where did they come from? They're all in and around Augusta, Georgia, yes. And I've had occasion to visit Augusta, I think, three times, mm. only three times in my life. Mm. And, and uh, they, do you know when they moved up? My, parent, my, my father moved to Detroit in April 1929 mm. and the, moved the family a few months later. Um, he had been, it explains a lot about my own orientation outlook. My father had been a, a fairly successful businessman in Augusta, Georgia, and had developed a very much a middle class bourgeois businessman's mentality. Um, but his, he, he, what he had was a dairy farm. Uh, now, the, the mortgage on his dairy farm was held by a bank. One of, the, one of the two black banks in the United States at that time, mm -hmm. the Penny Savings Bank of Augusta, Georgia. And one of the few, unfortunately, few conversations I had with my father, I asked him, well, how did you, why did you give that up and come to Detroit? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, the boll weevil went through the southeastern United States in the spring of 1929, like, like ran through Richmond. So the, in effect, the cotton crop was wiped out mm -hmm. and all of the banks had to liquidate. Mm -hmm. They had to pay up to, with what they had and they, they took his farm. And so he uh, went to Detroit where he had an uncle and got a job at the Ford Motor Company mm -hmm. and then moved the family there. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was all catastrophic in terms of the family income and resources and so forth. But in looking at the sweep of history, in a way it was fortunate that it occurred when it did because he got hired by the Ford Motor Company and he, he, he was employed to work on the, the, the part of the company called the Coke Oven, which was part of the steel mill at Ford, which meant that even when the Depression hit, uh, the the company had to lay off just about everyone, but they wanted to keep the steel mill partially operating. So they put the employees working in the foundry and on the steel mill on a rotation so that he was sporadically called back to work. So intermittently, he had work uh, during the Depression for three years. So that was the fortunate side. Yes. Of that yes. And so they settled in Detroit. Yes. And, and so uh, <clears throat> describe to someone who doesn't know much about Detroit. Of course. Um, where did you live? What was that community like? A very provocative question. Um, I lived on the west side of Detroit, um, a community that we've learned through hard <laughs> research. Mm -hmm. It's called Tireman Farm. Mm -hmm. Interesting, um, because we didn't know that it had that name. There were two elementary schools that served that neighborhood, and the uh, some really, uh, from my perspective, having now the experience of talking to people who live in other parts of the country, uh, given the overall uh, system of, of segregation and discrimination in the United States, this was a, a community that was fortunate. Um, I went to an elementary school, one of the two elementary schools in that community, Sampson. The, all but one of the teachers in that school were white. The, what's 
I think, extraordinary. And this is a period uh, from roughly, I started there in 1937 and finished in 46. Um, lynching, murder, abuse, systematic discrimination against black people was standard uh, all over the country, including Michigan. So that they found white teachers who were willing to teach black students without abuse, with encouragement, with expectations of success is, is uh, very unusual. Out of that school, th this is what caused the retros uh, retrospection. Um, out of Samson, there has grown up uh, Congressman John Conyers, who became Dean of the United States Congress. Elliot Hall, who became a Vice President of the Ford Motor Company. Um, Elliot Richards, who became Dean of the Yale School of Drama, was the first director of the play um, by Elaine Hansberry. That's become famous, the title escapes me for the moment. Um, Raisin in the Sun. And when he died, there was a full page obituary in the New York Times which described him as the Dean of Broadway directors. But he grew up in that neighborhood. But I could go on the list. The number of um, lawyers, uh, dentists, physicians, um, and elementary school teachers is, is, is just astounding. The community is relatively small. Um, I haven't completed my research to give you an estimate of the population of it. But um, uh, Conyers' brother, Nathan Conyers, for example, is one of the co-founders of the National Association of Minority Automobile Dealers and the Ford Motor Minority Dealers Association, which probably as organizations are responsible for creating more African-American millionaires than any other organization. Um, but you can go down the list of, of, of amazing accomplishments of people who've come out of that neighborhood. Well, we've, I've, I've discussed this with, uh, with both Nathan Conyers and Elliot Hall uh, to try and get some insight. Um, one is, I think, the extraordinary teachers that we happen to have. Uh, why these teachers expected us to succeed and demanded that we succeed, I don't know. They must have been selected to come and teach in that neighborhood. All except for Mrs. Co well, Mrs. Coates, who was there from the beginning. Uh, late, halfway through my time there, uh, another teacher came, um, Mrs. Ewing. And intermittently there had been a gym teacher, Miss, Miss Williams. But uh, except for those three, all the other teachers yeah. and the overall faculty. And we, the expectations of the faculty was very high. Of the students. Yes. My, uh, well, in my family, uh, I was uh, mentioned I was the youngest of six children. <clears throat> The, the second child was a brother, uh, Linwood Wright, who became an aeronautical engineer. Um, he worked for what was called NACA when he went to work for them. None of the aircraft companies, I understand, would hire an African-American engineer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he went to work for the federal government, the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, which did research. Um, his research was the research that made it possible to develop jet engines for commercial use. Now, at the end of World War II, this is a digression, but it's a digression. <laughs> at the end of World War II, the jet engine, which had been developed by the Germans, the Messerschmitt, um, was very fast, but it consumed a tremendous amount of fuel. The American aircraft manufacturers just took the engine as it was, a, and adapted it for use on, on uh, airliners or in aircraft for, for carrying passengers. But they soon found that it, it, they consumed much too much fuel to make uh, commercial use of the engine viable. viable. And so it, this is when the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics went into research and discovered or developed the technology by which it was possible to use those engines in a new and different way or modify the engines so that they could be made for uh, use for commercial purposes. And this gentleman was? This was Linwood Wright, my brother, whose name is in the uh, Smithsonian Aeronautical Hall of Fame. 
But he too grew up in that, now he wasn't born, he was born in Augusta. But um, from, I would suppose, about the seventh or eighth grade, he was in Detroit public schools. But Detroit had been a very progressive city in a sense. Um, the auto manufacturers um, were forward looking and they saw the automobile as, um, as an instrument for development of technology and the, and the cutting edge of technology at the time, I suppose. From a certain standpoint, they thought of it almost in the way that we think of Silicon Valley today. But the automobile was new technology advanced and we didn't even have enough roads in the country. Mm -hmm. the first, I'm told that the first paved road in the United States was in Detroit. It's Woodward Avenue, <laughs> Main Street. What Avenue? Woodward. Woodward. Okay. Yes, it's still there. Oh, <laughs> it, it's well, the no, it was the, I mean, that is, that was known as the place where cars were manufactured. I mean, yes. that was a big deal. Yeah, there, there were, and there were many, many manufacturers. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, of course, General Motors put together a lot of them together, but uh, many of them uh, just went out of business. They couldn't compete. Mm -hmm. But there was, when I was growing up, there were the big three, of course, the, the uh, conglomeration of General Motors, uh, uh, Cadillac, Oldsmobile, Buick, Pontiac, and Chevrolet, but then Ford, which mm -hmm. developed then the, but, and Chrysler which again was, it was a, a, a collection of cars that had been pulled together into one, under one umbrella. But there were the three small uh, independents, uh, Nash, um, Hudson, and Packard. Packard yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. those are still, uh, the, the, uh, the other independent um, was in Indiana, um, mm. name of which escapes me for the moment. So, uh, so you lived on the west side of Detroit? Yes, in this little community that we now know is called yes. Tireman Farm. Farms, yeah. <laughs> and um, what was that community like for you? <laughs> well, looking back, of course, you, you, the memory glosses things. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it seems almost like a small town. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, people pretty much knew each other. Um, on my particular block, uh, there were three or four, always three or four families with children. And so we, we, we played together. Um, at the end of the street, when we lived on Van Court, at the end of the street was the elementary school, Sampson. And of course, that meant there was a playground to go to just a uh, hundred yards away. Um, something else that was very strong in that community were churches. Now, whatever one attitude one might take about churches and religion, uh, they were a powerful stabilizing force. Um, and the if you would speak about that, that's very important. Well, from my reading of, of the social history of the United States in that period, life was very difficult for, for people in general, and men often found that uh, circumstances made it difficult for them to support a family and they just took off. Well, one of the forces that tended to restrain or mitigate that practice was churches, which, which stre uh, stressed the importance of staying w w with the wife and, and, and the family. And in that community, it was, it was successful. Now, one of the reasons I think it was successful, aside from the fact of the churches, was employment. I am persuaded that guaranteed employment w would be a, a tremendous stabilizing force in the whole society and would not mitigate, but I think really eliminate many of the social ills that we are so concerned about today, agonizing about drug use, for example, but also abandonment. So often you read the stories in the paper about uh, some catastrophe or a killing or and Here's a woman raising a child alone. Where, where is the father? And I think the reason there's no father is that dependable, reliable, dignified employment with, with, uh, with status is not available, uh, mainly for minority black men in particular, 
But to a great degree, this is a problem for the white community as well. But by keeping black and white in conflict with each other, we're unable to work to, toward a solution. So the churches in your particular community were a very in, important stabilizing yes. influence. And of course, spiritual. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but they provided a, an ethical, moral basis for existence and for behavior. Um, and they were, so there were... So it as a child to go to one of those churches in Detroit? Well, they had uh, programs for young, for, for children. Uh, in a way, it's surprising to see that churches now seem to be struggling and thinking that it's a new and original idea to have uh, programs for children, but uh, my recollection is that uh, every Sunday and then every summer, there was a summer, summer vacation Bible school. <laughs> so that they had programs to keep us engaged for the summer, both uh, religious, but also recreational and, and exercise. Throughout the summer? Yes, well, my recollection is it was throughout the summer. Now it may be that it was less yeah, no. than a full uh, eight weeks or 12 weeks. So, so religious, Training, if you will, uh, yes. was a major part of the whole year. Yes. Summer included. I mean, exactly. Sundays, of course, but the whole summer. Yeah. Now, again, people have problems with, with uh, religion and, and the inculcation of mm -hmm. some of the principles of certain religions. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think it, it's incontrovertible that mm -hmm. they are a stabilizing force, change. They can be a stabilizing force. <laughs> yes, yes. And so um, did the children, uh, you, you had classes on Sundays. Oh yes, Sunday, uh, yeah. Sunday school, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> yeah, when they, when they had special programs and little publications for children, mm -hmm. starting from very young, the simple things, mm -hmm. uh, kindergarten level, and they graduated up. Okay. Uh, what else about the community was how, how did the community support each other or itself? Well, as I mentioned, of course, the, the major employer were the automobile plants, mm -hmm. in Ford in particular. Um, but I mean psychologically, socially. How did the community, you know, what was it like? Well, the, the churches, then also, as, as they grew older, there was the growing force of trade unions. And, and not trade unions, plural, singular, mm -hmm. United Automobile Workers. Mm -hmm. uh, and that provided uh, some kind of uh, uh, social cohesion mm -hmm. and, and purpose. Mm -hmm. The World War II started, and that too, uh, for better or for worse, provided a remarkable uh, kind of, of, uh, of cohesion and purpose mm -hmm. um, in, in it's perhaps perverse to see it that way, but um, the, the purpose of the country was to defeat this evil force, and it was relatively easy for people to, to unite and, and join, per, join together. Uh, they had a lot of programs for young people. Um, they had paper drives, for example. I, I can recall uh, one winter in particular, I, be hard put to tell you which one it was, 42 or 43, um, working with a, a classmate, Lewis Brown, to collect paper. And that by that time, I had two of my three brothers in the service. Mm -hmm. So I had a sense of commitment to support them. Mm -hmm. And so we were collecting paper. And <laughs> we were collecting newspaper from people to turn into the paper drive, which was centered in the school. Mm -hmm. But our conveyance, for the paper, the newspaper stacked up was a sled. You know, <laughs> the snow, I would guess, in my memory, was about you know six, seven inches deep, and we're pulling this sled along, and the paper trying to keep the papers from <laughs> falling off the sled. And we got, if you turn in for every ten pounds of paper, I think you got a stripe. When you first signed up to be to collect paper, you got a patch which you could have your mother sew on your jacket, mm -hmm. and then you got a stripe for each 10 pounds of, of paper you turned in. And there were drives to collect um, toothpaste tubes. 
Now, it, it, my reading of history since looking back is that that none of that really had any effect on the, on the uh, logistics of World War II. But what it did was mobilize the population and keep everyone focused uh, on, on the objective. The, the toothpaste tubes were made of metal. In fact, I think recycled. toothpaste tubes were made of lead to be recycled. Lead to be recycled. Yes, I yes. think they were actually made of lead. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, ultimately all three of my brothers were in the service and I, I don't, I can, I've never tried to count the number of cousins. My father was one of 14 children. My mother was one of nine. And so we had a lot of cousins in the military and our thinking was we've got to support and back them. We have to win this war and hopefully these, these family members will come back mm -hmm. al alive. Mm -hmm. Not all of them did. The sort of, uh, I'm not sure hero is the right word, but my, I had one cousin who did become a Tuskegee fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. who, he was unfortunately killed in an accident, a uh, flying accident in Italy. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, some family members uh, uh, entered into so combat. what was it like for African Americans to join the military at that point? Now, <laughs> this is tricky because I was a child. Yes. Um, I was uh, 12, 13 when the war ended. But uh, in, in retrospect, in some ways, it's embarrassing to you. But, but, I, I thought the war was a wonderful opportunity to be a hero. And I wanted to get in there. I was sure that I could do something miraculous and help uh, win, win the war. Um, your question again was? But so, so because the military was also segregated. Yes, and that was uh, an issue. Um, but for, for a 12 year old, it was a background issue. I'm not sure to what extent I really, I, I'm sure I did not fully appreciate what it meant. Mm -hmm. my, my brothers uh, complained mm -hmm. uh, more than once. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, my oldest brother was drafted before the war started. He was drafted in April of 41. Mm -hmm. And he was sent to Fort Custer. And mm -hmm. they had a riot at Fort Custer before the war started uh, between black and white troops. Mm -hmm. um, and there were other. now. Uh, one of my activities during this during the war was uh, selling, peddling in effect, um, black newspapers. I had five newspapers. I had the Michigan Chronicle, the Detroit Tribune, uh, Chicago Afro American, the Afro American, um, the Chicago Defender, the Chicago Defender, the Afro American, and um, there's one more, the biggest one. It'll come to me. Um, and uh, these were weekly newspapers. And th certainly no week passed that there wasn't a story, uh, usually several stories, about conflicts uh, in different parts of the South uh, between black troops and white troops, or between black m troops and local constabulary, the sheriffs and, mm -hmm. and marshals and, and the authorities, because nearly all of our training facilities are in the south. Mm -hmm. there, you count almost on one hand the number of, uh, of uh, military army bases in the north, you know, Camp Drum, Fort Custer, and mm -hmm. I guess one in Colorado. But uh, the majority of these facilities are in the south. Um, and a lot of these troops, of course, had grown up in the north, and while we had experienced uh, discrimination and segregation, um, it, wasn't, it was not supported by law uh, on the books. Now, policemen sometimes enforced it, even though there was no law that gave them the authority to do that. But essentially, um, young black men who had grown up in the North were, didn't expect the, the kind of restrictions that they ran into in the South. Or when they encountered it and they saw these signs, they resented it and had the illusion that they could resist it. And the, the, the full story, I'm not sure that anyone's ever done a full story, history of uh, how many uh, conflicts there were and how many people were killed. Uh, in, in 
those riots, you mean? Yes. 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 But um, and the the military had a program had a had a system for prev for restraining the, the black troops from writing home about these things. Uh, the, my oldest brother, the one I mentioned before, was drafted in April of '41, was at one point uh, in stationed in Camp Rucker, Alabama, and uh, they had a, a riot there. And my mother's advice always was, you know, don't get involved. Mm -hmm. You can't win. Uh, yeah. So you've gone to this school, which you described. From, Samson, from, yes. From what? Kindergarten all the way? All the way through the eighth through, grade. Through the eighth grade. And yes. what happened after eighth grade? Yeah, one other background factor to that that might be interesting to consider because we've looked at it. Um, when I started Samson, it was current kindergarten through eighth grade. I would venture to guess, uh, again, this is the cloud of memory, um, that there, the white students enrolled in that school were maybe 20, 25 percent. By the time I graduated eight years later, there were no white students in the school. Now, we still had essentially all white faculty, except for Miss Coates and by then Miss Ewing. Um, but the um, but it became all uh, black. Students. Become all black, yes. Now again, th these were blacks with middle class mentality, uh, upward bound. Uh, the idea of going to college w was expected. Um, at least that's what was said. Um, how many of my classmates uh, in my graduating class from Samson? Well, there must have been, what, 30, 35 of us. And I would venture to guess maybe 15, but half of them went on to college. Um, it, it's interesting to look back. Um, and, and because now um, we can see there were some very serious, as there are in any community, problems uh, the children were having um, uh, with parental abuse, uh, with uh, psych psychological problems that, that just develop uh, normally, or, or not normally, but frequently with, with young people. Um, but in, in casual conversations, we talked about going to college. <clears throat> and sometimes someone would ridicule somebody and say, no, you're going to wind up in the foundry, mm -hmm. like all the men who work around here. And mm -hmm. oh, no, I'm going to, go to college. Now, in my case, the idea of going to college was relatively, underlined relatively clear because of this brother who was the, became an aeronautical engineer. Um, my two sisters uh, attended college, neither of them graduated. Um, and the, the the other two brothers, uh, the oldest brother, just wasn't. He, he was not a student. <laughs> he, mm -hmm. he he did not like college. Did not like school. He didn't like high school. Um, the the youngest brother, who was uh, closest to me, my father had some idea. <clears throat> I, I think. And I never discussed this with him, but, or he never passed this on to me. But I think he may have might have been looking at W. B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, and thinking he should have a foot in both camps, because he he gave strong support to the brother who was going to college with the for the aeronautical engineer, but he put great pressure on the younger brother to go to what was Wilbur Wright Trade School in Detroit and take automotive. And he, he bought equipment and supplies and encouraged him to, to become an expert on auto repair. He seemed to think, and in fact, he, he at, at least once or twice in my presence, uh, tried to persuade my brother to open his own uh, repair garage. Mm -hmm. um, it was a mechanical shop. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to say that, that, that my youngest brother, Marvin, was, was very good, and he enjoyed it. But 
he, that's not really what he wanted to do. And I'm not sure he could see a way clear to resist. Uh, I'm not sure it was clear in his own mind that he didn't want to do that. But uh, he had other interests. Um, interesting irony. I d talked about this uh, in his adult years. Um, and he, he lamented or complained, really, that uh, our father pushed him to, to go into automobiles. And, and, and it, I don't think what my father had in mind, if presuming he had a clear vision, was possible. It is now. But um, Marvin, that, that youngest brother, um, <laughs> rose to be supervisor for maintenance for the Detroit Edison Company, which is an executive position in the Detroit Edison Company. Um, well, I could say a lot about that. Please tell us you'd Well, um, he, he evolved uh, when he came out of the service. One of the places you could, you could Yet uh, a black could get a, a decent paying job in the city besides uh, in, in the automobile companies was with the public utility companies. Something that now it may be that some state legislation or possibly wouldn't be city, but possibly some state legislation or it might be federal FEP, Federal Fair Employment Practice legislation, had created a situation in which um, utility companies, because they had done work with, by, for, or with the federal government, had to uh, consider blacks for employment because uh, quite a number of blacks went to work for the Detroit Edison Company, Michigan Consolidated Gas, uh, and um, maybe they went, I don't remember they weren't with the water company. The telephone company became a big employer for black people. And I suspect that all of that, uh, other people who follow these things would, would maybe be clearer about the reason for all this. But I suppose all that came out of World War II legislation. Mm -hmm. A. Philip Randolph and all the civil rights pressure on, on Roosevelt and the Democratic Party to, to pass fair employment practice. And so these, these opportunities for employment opened up. And um, my two, uh, non-engineer brothers uh, both went to work for Detroit Edison Company and Marvin uh, the youngest uh, started out uh, working in the auto garage um, but somehow for reasons that are never cleared to him or to me um, he was selected out of that garage to be a chauffeur and the top executives for the Detroit Edison Company uh, Detroit Edison at those days was, it was a, a very important corporation. It covered southeastern Michigan, so it was a large corporation. Of course, Detroit in those days had almost two million population. So uh, the man who was president of the company was, was an important figure. And he chose my brother to be his, uh, sometimes not his, not his regular chauffeur, but but uh, conversations took place between uh, my brother and these guys. They're driving off to Ann Arbor or mm -hmm. Lansing or someplace. Um, and I think it, it was the, out of those conversations that came a recognition, this boy is smart. <laughs> he, he could do things. And so they, he started getting uh, assignments outside of the garage. Uh, in fact, they moved him out of the garage and made him a, a troubleshooter. And then he, but he advanced up, and I think it was because of his contact with the top executives in the company, who who, who talked with him. Yeah. It's it's a f yeah. peculiar it's little uh, uh, sidelight and the kind of things that can happen yeah. in life. And then, so when you, um, you know, it's so. I'm sorry. I'm I'm oh, always please. amazed. There's a, well, the fact that unless you have contact yes. with a black person, you, you don't think about, you know, these are people, they are smart people, you know, I mean, there's, you know, yes. like other people. And, but the fact that there's no, 
interaction. Well, well, I would say that you know there are a lot of the media in the United States. I, I think is, well, first of all, the media is a part of the system, mm -hmm. and they have been a major part of the problem. Um, they condition people, uh, I think even on this street, to think in a certain way about a person. That they don't see uh, a white shirt, a suit, a tie, or, or, or <laughs> a walking stick. They see a black face, and that's all they see. And the anxieties you know, grow. Not for everybody, of course. But that's in, in th this city at this point, I think, is has become heated up that way. Um, to some extent, the Post seems to be now r putting these reports in the metro section and, and condensing them so that they don't always have on the front page, you know, uh, mm -hmm. s some miscreant who, who's killed somebody or, or uh, got caught, been caught robbing or breaking in someplace. Um, but the media build, builds up the story. Yes, the evening television news. Mm -hmm. And that's true all over the United States. Uh, more than once I have found myself in uh, Bloomington, Indiana, or Los Angeles, California, mm -hmm. turn on the evening news. Well, somebody got shot or robbed and then they've got some black guy uh, and they've kept him up all night and so he comes to the camera and, and he, he looks like he w is the criminal. And, but I don't recall, no, there have been. I was gonna say I don't recall having seen a white criminals treated in just this way, but it, it's not very common <laughs> for them to show a white criminal in the same way. Uh, and you wonder, though, how, how is it that in, in Washington, D.C., in New York, Los Angeles, uh, all over the country, the television stations follow this practice? <laughs> so what, what happened after high school? Well, uh, I went to Highland Park Junior College. Uh, some, some oddities may appear in this story. I may have to backtrack and explain why I did these things. But I went to Highland Park Junior College, and I, I'd gone to a technical high school um, because I wanted to be like my brother. Um, Marvin. Uh, uh, well, Linwood, oh, uh, uh, who we call, we call Clint. His name was Linwood Clinton Wright in the family. For some reason, my brothers were known inside the family uh, by their middle names, uh, except me. <laughs> uh, but um, I wanted to be like, like Clint. But, well, there's several glamorous things about Clint. Uh, one was that um, he, pursuing a, a degree in aeronautical engineering at Wayne University, which is a local university in Detroit, one of the requirements for a, a bachelor's degree in aeronautical engineering was that you had to demonstrate capability to pilot a plane. You had to get a, a, a pilot's license. So he flew airplanes. And wow, <laughs> every time I saw a plane over our neighborhoods, that's my brother. Uh. And my friends said, oh, no, that's not your brother. Said, yeah, he's flying that airplane. In addition, he was on the track team. And, and this is a, a little odd aspect of, of, of Detroit history. Wayne University had had no athletics. The year that my brother uh, Clint enrolled there, they had just previously decided that they were going to start an athletic program. So they hired, the first step was to hire a coach, David Holmes. And they brought him there and they said, well, we don't have any money, but we wanted to start an athletic program. And so he worked out with them that he was going to step by step develop an athletic program. So he's going to start with something that didn't cost very much money, track. And according to my brother, he went down on, on uh, the day when students were lined up to register, registration day, and he went down the line looking for guys who he thought might make good track uh, people. And he picked, among others, my brother. And it, it turned out that they had one of the best 
uh, mile rate relay and medley relay teams in the country. So he, he traveled around the country uh, uh, and he came back home with, with uh, you know, medals and, and, and ribbons and so forth. And then he could fly an airplane. That's it. I want to be, I want to be like him. Uh, he suggested that because as I was graduating from high school, the war ended and the, uh, the aircraft industry went into a steep decline, that I might hedge my bets by go, when I was going to go to Cass Tech and they had an aeronautical program in, in the high school, aeronautical, automotive, uh, architectural, and also pre-med and so forth. He suggested that I go for architecture because the prerequisites for um, aeronautical were essentially the same. I would have to get all the math courses uh, through algebra the three and trig and trigonometry and so forth. And so by the time I graduated in 1950, we could see what possible. So I, I enrolled in architecture. And uh, Wayne didn't have an architecture program when I graduated from, from I went to a school called Cass Technical High School, which where, where? in Detroit. In Detroit, yeah. Um, as it happens, I, my graduating class was June 1950, and the people in that graduating class, not all of whom graduated, uh, are rather remarkable. Uh, they, they had a music program. It was claimed at one time that there were more Cass Tech graduates in orchestras in the United States than any college. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but in that graduating class where became a nationally, internationally famous uh, jazz artist, uh, Donald Byrd, Curtis Fuller, um, if I can remember the names of them, uh, Roland Hanna, Sir Roland Hanna, um, but a whole raft of, 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 of musicians. But I went to Highland Park Junior College and, but I got very act I had become very active in my church in the youth group and um, as a consequence in civic activities. I represented the youth uh, at, at various uh, events organized by the Detroit Council of Churches, for example, which was the Detroit affiliate of the National Council of Churches. And in addition, the Detroit Public School, not Detroit Public Schools, the Detroit Public Libraries had entered into an agreement with the United Automobile Workers Union to um, sponsor a program on radio. It's before television. Uh, um, at frequency FM radio was new, it was just getting started, and the UAW had built or WDET, which still exists. Um, and so with the Detroit Public Library, they had to fit, now what do you do? You got this radio station, you got to put something on the air. And so with the public libraries, they asked the libraries to present youth for a weekly program, Youth Looks at Books. And so the Detroit Public Libraries, uh, four or five of them, I don't know how many library branches there are, but there are about five of them, I think, that participated in this program. And a friend of mine, uh, John Conyers' brother, Nathan, who was a classmate of mine, was drafted into this game, and I saw him in the newspaper. I said, how do you do that? And he told me, so I went in, and <laughs> so I joined the high school international club. And I was given the book, uh, Red Star Over China by Edgar Snow to, re to discuss on radio. Now that's significant because um, when I was in junior college and I was chairman of the United Nations Day program, I picked up our speaker for the United Nations uh, convocation and it was a woman, Marie Cole Berger, and she, driving her from the train station, she came to Detroit by train, not airplane, <laughs> from New York. Uh, she was in the car and she asked me, um, you know, wh wh who are you and what do you do? And I said, well, I'm 
I'm going to give up pursuit of a degree in architecture, and I'm going to switch to political science. She says, why? I said, because that's what I'm interested in. I'm involved in all these activities through the church and through the library system here and the union. Uh, and she says, what are you going to do? I said, well, I think I'll take a degree in political science. And she says, what are you going to do with a degree in political science? I said, I guess it means I have to go to law school. She said, have you ever heard of the Foreign Service? I said, yes, I have. I read about it in Red Star Over China. She said, do you think that kind of career would interest you? Said, yes, it would. <laughs> and that started a correspondence. So I corresponded with her for about five years. <laughs> How, uh, how old was I then? Uh, I was 19, 18, 19 okay. years old. Okay. So you started corresponding with her? Yes. Okay. And I corresponded with her until I enrolled, well, beyond that. But it was she who guided me to Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Okay. Now, I didn't steadily follow that. I continued the correspondence. But sometimes I wandered off into pursuit of the possibility of going into international business. Didn't work out. <laughs> uh, in 1955, the newspapers and magazines were saying, this is going to be a big year. American business is going to recruit young people in a new and different way. They have internships. And so this is going to be great. I'm going to get an internship. So I. I filled out the university you know, form, and I took my graduation photographs, and I couldn't afford but about 15 that I could afford to give away. And I submitted 15, altogether 25 applications, but 15 with photographs. Of course, the 15 were turned down. <laughs> they didn't get a response. The other 10, some of them got a response. I, I thought I had a good chance with Pan American Airways and TWA because they'd be curious. They're kind of a joke to have Wilbur Wright working for them. <laughs> so <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got an invitation to come for an interview in Detroit. So I, it's fine. I go down to Detroit and I go to the TWA <laughs> office on Detroit. It was Detroit's answer to Fifth Avenue was the Washington Boulevard. Mm -hmm. They had exclusive shops and stores there and then the airline office. So I, I breeze in there <laughs> for this interview. The young woman at the desk, you know, who, 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 like what, not in those words, what do you want? What, you know, yes, can I help you? And I'm here, here for an interview. You here for an interview? Yes. What's so strange about that? I didn't ask that, of course. But <laughs> she said, well, have a seat. She went in her office. She came back out. Didn't say anything. And then there was a buzzer, and she went back in, and she came out and says, this is going to be kind of a wait. Is that okay? I said, well, yeah. I came here for an interview. That's all I've got to do. And so I was sitting about 45 minutes, you know, and it, 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 eventually it became apparent they didn't want to interview me. <laughs> and it had essentially the same exercise with Pan American. So out of the 25 applications... I got, they didn't even respond. Right, but but the ones without the pictures, so you got two I got two, uh, yes. And maybe another two on campus. campus okay. um, um, one that I got uh, was with International Harvester. Mm -hmm. And the guy was kind of surprised to see me. And he said, well, you and I, we know what's going on in this country. But International Harvester is a very progressive company. We see ourselves as on the cutting edge of change. And I think our company is ready to make this change. He didn't say what he was talking about. But, just, <laughs> but I, I, I figured out. <laughs> so, you know, great. He says, I'm going to go back to the company and I'm going to fight for you. I'll let you know what the result is. You know, whatever the outcome is, I will let you know. And he did. His name was Vandenbosch. Uh, and he wrote me a page and a half of, of excuses and explanations mm -hmm. as to why International Harvester couldn't hire me. 
for a junior management trainee. <laughs> so then what did you decide to do? Well, I had I had been really lucky. I'd gotten a job with the city of Detroit um, two summers before as a, a forester, they, a tree artisan, trimming, removing, spraying trees for the summer. It paid very well, paid three times the minimum wage. Um, and sometimes I worked with a regular crew, sometimes well, a couple of summers I worked with a college crew. Um, and so I went back to that. It paid very well. I mean, I was getting the same wage that these guys were supporting the family with. So um, I went back to that and then I decided, well, I can't do this forever. <laughs> um, I think what I'll do is get a, an advanced degree in economics and that'll increase my chances of getting a job in business and in government possibly. So I, I went back to trimming trees and worked. That was turned out to be, from a physical standpoint, a good thing. Um, but I, I resigned in January to go back to grad school and then I met this girl. <laughs> so that made it a little more attractive too. <laughs> so I went back to take some uh, pre-grad and grad courses in economics. And where was this? Back in Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor. University, of the University of Michigan. Yes. Yeah, I, um, that's an episode I didn't mention. From Highland Park Junior College, I mentioned National Scholarship Service right. for Negro Students. And the list, um, out of the schools that they mentioned, Case, mm -hmm. Western Reserve, and others, mm -hmm. um, Denison was on the list. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember all the reasons for but I picked Denison. Mm -hmm. and, and for better or for worse, uh, for better in the sense that I didn't st found it terrible and didn't stay, mm -hmm. transferred to the University of Michigan, which I, this is my natural home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, the, um, I, I chose Denison and spent a semester there, um, which was an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was interesting being isolated. Mm -hmm. there, the enrollment at Denison at that time, I think, I believe was 1,200 students, mm -hmm. and there were seven black students. There were five guys, counting me, and two women. Um, two of the uh, black students were from Africa, from what was then called the Gold Coast, from Ghana. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Kwashi Kunadu Oti mm -hmm. and uh, Richard Arno Oprinson. <laughs> and then there, there were uh, it was Hal Walker who became bureau chief for NBC out of Bonn, Germany. David Redden, uh, Gordon Dillard, and Wilbur Wright. That's four. And then there were Dick and, uh, and KK. That's six guys. There were eight of us, I guess. Um, and two women. And two, you know, six guys and two women. Um, Marge Bates and uh, Florida Fisher. Um, but after one semester, it, it uh, was too hard. It was you, meaning, uh, too isolated or too. What was it? Yeah, I was socially isolated, mm -hmm. uh, and financially it didn't work out. They, they they hadn't offered enough money really. Mm -hmm. I had two jobs. I went there with one job, and I was kept coming up short. So I got a second job. Uh, the first job was a waiter in the uh, freshman dining hall, which was I thought it was kind of an interesting, useful experience. Uh, but then I didn't have enough money, so they gave me a job as a courier delivering the bulletins around the mm. campus, which in a perverse kind of way was interesting too because I got to see more of the campus than I would have otherwise. Um, but uh, I, in junior college, I had been incredibly, looking back, incredibly successful. I left junior college as president of the student government. I had been in the Student Drama Society. We had put on a two plays a year, a, a, one play a year, and a, two plays in the two years I was there. Um, and I wrote for the student newspaper. Uh, so, uh, and that was a, a, a stark transformation from Cast Tech. I struggled through Cast Tech. I was not a natural draftsman. <laughs> and, it, and it was expensive. 
uh, trying, I don't know, if, 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 trying to do a, a drawing with ink on cloth mm. is a very difficult business. Uh, the ink, you know, if you, you have to move the pen at an even rate or the ink spreads. And then you go on with it. But there are all kinds of problems involved in just the drafting. And I, I was not a skilled draftsman. I worked part-time for an architect, uh, White and Griffin, architects and engineers. Uh, and they too could see that I, you're not cut out to be an architect, <laughs> at least at, at the current level of technology. I never found out really what it would be like to be an architect, which is to imagine, to create and design. Sure. But, uh, but all this uh, do yeah, doggy was, work was, was, was killing yeah. me. <laughs> so I, I got out of it. Mm -hmm. um, so you went to U of Michigan. Yes. And, and that's uh, where you, did you study? Uh, po political, you science, political science, international okay. relations. Ah, okay. And th to, to make it viable financially, uh, I, I met a guy, Dave Redden, there. Dave was ready to leave Dennis. He had started at Dennis, and he'd been there two years. And he was anxious to leave. Mm. Uh, so we conspired together. And we looked at uh, Ohio State University and University of Michigan. Um, his parents were supporting him so he could, he could consider being out of state in Michigan. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that kind of resources, so I couldn't be an out of state at Ohio State. Mm -hmm. So we agreed to transfer the University of Michigan. And how are we going to make it financially you know, right. less difficult? And he, looking through, found mention of student-owned and operated co-ops. So we both applied to, for positions in the co-ops. And we both were accepted. And so I was accepted. Dave and I both went to Nakamura House on State Street. And I was elected president of the house. Fascinating experience. The, the, the Americans were not a majority, they were a plurality. But in that house, there were students, there was a student from Argentina, one from Chile, two from Pakistan, one from India, uh, uh, one from Lebanon, but people from all over the world. It's this fabulous experience. Um, and uh, from uh, three from Latvia. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's too bad I didn't make, keep notes because you could probably write an interesting book about that. Definitely. Two of the most. Is this the time the young woman comes into the scene? Yes. She she, she was the house the second year I was there. She came uh, transferred in from Asbury College in Tennessee, I think it is, um, and. She was she was house mother actually, at, at uh, the, the one of the women's houses. In those days, there were three men's houses and three women's houses. For uh, African Americans. No. No, for who? Everybody. Oh, only three. What kind of houses? Three houses. The, three. Well, there were residences oh, that had been converted, in, into uh, student dormitories. In oh, effect. I see. I'm sorry. The, they were student dormitories. Okay. In effect, yes. That were owned and operated by the inter. But I these see were some. not segregated houses. No. No. Okay. No, I'm telling you, all these people from all over the all world over there. The world were yes. Okay. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, and, and they elected me president. I know that's <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Nice. It, it didn't seem to me unusual at the time because I had been president of the student yes. government in Highland Park Junior College, and the majority of students there were white. Uh, <laughs> so it, it didn't strike me as odd. Uh, now, what had happened, I think, was that uh, some old guys who had been in that house for a while, looking at applicants, were looking for somebody who's going to be willing to be president. I, I think a lot of people, most of the guys now didn't want to be president, mm. but they wanted somebody who was willing to take on the job. <laughs> and they saw that I had been president of the student I government. See. Uh, and, and I also, just before I left Denison, uh, apparently somebody in the student in the, the administration d discovered that I was unhappy, and so they made some quick shovels and tried to get me involved in some activities. And so I was, the, uh, what was it? The, uh, I forgot. There was there was some student activity they got me involved in. 
And so you you finished at you finished your degree at Michigan. Michigan. Yes. Yes. And then what happened? Well, that's when I went back. To, I, uh, I had all this efforts with the private business that didn't work out. So I went back to my job as a forester, the job I'd had uh, in, Detroit. in Detroit, yes. Mm. Digressing for a moment, there's a little episode. Uh, summer of 1951, when I was still in junior college, I, having real difficulty finding a job that would pay enough money to keep me in college, my mother said, go downtown to the river and Woodward Avenue and go in every store on one side asking for a job and then if that doesn't work when you get to Grand Circus Park turn around and go back down the other side. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> so I tried it. <laughs> if you ever go to Detroit and <laughs> go down to the river and start up and you discover that the, the job I got was at uh, S.S. Kresge. You know S.S. Kresge? You've heard of Kmart. Mm -hmm. Well, S.S. Kresge was, was a network of dime stores, like Woolworth. Mm. Oh, yes. And they closed the dime stores and opened up Kmart. Mm -hmm. So the, the, I see. There's a, but anyway, it was, a, it, was a, it was a five and ten cent store, like W.T. Grant and yes, Woolworth. Yes, yes. And I got a job there as a janitor at night. Um, and there was a crew of about eight guys, all African American, and we polished. Strangely, that store is a very large store. Um, had handrails that were brass and unprotected. So during the day, people of course grass them, and the oils tarnished. The, so those had to be polished at night, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the floors downstairs had to be mopped every night, and. Well, at that point, I was six feet tall, but I had, I only weighed 98 pounds. <laughs> the mop, when it was wet, was 40 pounds. <laughs> it was killing me. And, and we, we, there were about, I think, four aisles, and then there are two main aisles, one at this end, one at that, let's say north and south, and then there were these uh, perpendicular aisles in between. And the trick was to, they had a system when I started working there, to mop the, the, the north aisle and then go down these perpendicular aisles and then rejoin. And I started out with them and, of course, <laughs> they soon found that everybody was finished and I was <laughs> still <laughs> swinging that mop. <laughs> After, and they, recycled, they cycled it so that uh, a after, I think, uh, three nights or four nights, whatever, I don't remember the number, uh, on the mop, you got to do some of the relatively easy work of polishing brass and mirrors. Mm. <laughs> but the guy who is in charge of the, the, the crew says, Walt, he says, this isn't working. Mm. He, with all the guys around, he says, you go on mirror and brass polishing, we'll do the mopping. Mm. <laughs> well, he knew I was only going to be there for the summer. So, yeah. so, so, <laughs> so uh, so I'm up on the second floor of this dime store. Now, the, the columns up there are about 36, 40 inches square. And they're marble up to about six feet, and then above that to the ceiling, which must be about a 12-foot ceiling, is, there's a mirror. So, and we had this ladder a 10-foot ladder, and I'm standing on top of the ladder polishing the mirror. The night watchman, who was white, uh, seemed to have the idea that he had some authority over you. And most of the time we were, uh, no, Willie, no, don't, just go away, don't bother us. We know, we know what, Walt knows what we have to do, and, <laughs> and how, how much supervision does a crew that mops the, cleans the store every night need? But anyway, he, he was the guy who about, he probably retired from someplace, 65 years old, and a little guy who probably had a you know, Napoleonic complex anyway. Um, well, he, he came, I was upstairs polishing the mirror, and they had insisted, I don't know if Walt or Willie had insisted, that I only turn on lights around the column I was polishing. 
and I had to do four sides. So I'm polishing the mirror and I'm standing on a 10 foot ladder, lost in my thoughts. And this guy came upstairs quietly, got directly under the ladder and he says, how are you doing? Yeah! <laughs> I didn't fall, but I came down the ladder and for the only time in my life, I went up to Willie and said, don't you ever, don't you ever do that again. He was stunned. Like the monkey can talk, you know. <laughs> how, how does this this black guy, you know, talk to me like that? He didn't say anything. He just looked at me and he left. The next evening, when I came to work, Willie, as usual, was at the door checking employees leaving, and those coming in, and he says, "The manager wants to see you." What? He said, "I don't know. He's, he's over there moving counters or supervising the moving of counters." So I went over and said, Mr. Bulk, Willie, he says, you stand over there. Can't you see I'm busy? So I waited. And I said, I, I'm supposed to punch the clock at 6.30. So I, at 6.25, I said, Mr. Bullock, I'd like to wait over there. So I waited at quarter to seven. He says, I guess you know you're late. Go home and see if you can't get here on time tomorrow. <laughs> so I went home. The next day, I was there at 6.15. And as I got there, Willie was at the door. He says, oh, what are you doing here? You're finished. Well, I've been fired. Just, the Korean War is going on, and that student deferment. I needed another job. It was, you know, I had walked about a half mile or a mile on Woodward Avenue to find this stupid job. So what am I going to do? So I walked. I had been driving my father's car and walking back to my father's car, I came to a block. The car was diagonally opposite and there was this parking lot between. And I started to walk around and said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to walk diagonally across this lot through the car. And as I started across the lot, there's a little shanty where they you know, punch the tickets for people uh, and, and the, where people pay. And a guy came out just as I was walking by. And I said, you need somebody to work here. Not the way to ask for a job, but <laughs> he said, I don't know, ask the foreman. I said, well, where is he? He's around back there. So I went around, just walked up to a white guy. This is a black guy who came out of this shanty, a white guy. I said, do you need anybody to work here? He says, can you start right now? Yes! <laughs> I, I need a job right now. Moreover, it's parking cars, and I love driving cars. <laughs> so, in addition, I've been making 65 cents an hour at the dime store. They paid 75 cents an hour, <laughs> so I got a raise and a, and a job. I could only work that job during the summer. Parking lot, I can work year-round, because I'm willing to work when other people don't want to work. I can study at night. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you finished at uh, Michigan, U of Michigan? Yes. And then what? Um, I went back, you know, I went back to work in Detroit, then I came back to Ann Arbor to take a course, some courses in graduate economics. Mm -hmm. And my advisor, incidentally, was uh, Professor Gardner Ackley, mm -hmm. who was chairman of the department and really didn't, I, I don't know how I got assigned to him or he got assigned to me, but he wasn't happy clearly. And he gave me virtually no guidance or assistance. Um, that's funny because about 10 years later, I was in the Foreign Service and, and serving at the embassy in Rome and Gardner Ackley turns up as ambassador. <laughs> so, when he's doing, you know, greeting everybody, I said, do you remember me? And he says, no. I said, well, I was, you were my student advisor. He said, how was I? I said, it didn't work out. <laughs> I didn't try to lambast him for a bad job. <laughs> but anyway, I, um, I went back and, and took these econ courses. Uh, there's a whole battleground there, but um, the, at the, when June came around, there was a, a new thing that was uh, Federal Service Entrance Exam, FSEE, and the JMA, Junior Management Assistant, 
program. So I took the exams for that, and then I got offers from the federal government for jobs. And the, the, without going into the details about why I took them, I took a job with the Social Security Administration to be a claims. For one thing, they offered a higher beginning grade. And I started at the um, downtown Detroit Social Security office as a claims examiner, which set in motion a whole series of interesting, not always happy adventures. <laughs> um, that's what you want to hear about, isn't it? <laughs> if you'd like to share, yes. Well, yeah. I've written about it. Um, there were, as I recall, 16 claims examiners and four field representatives. Each claims examiner had a secretary, and there was, I think, two secretaries for the four field reps. In addition, of course, there was a, at that time, there was a manager and a supervisor. Um, of the 16 uh, claims representatives, um, three were Jewish and two were black. And the, the supervisor was a woman who, for whatever reason, harassed and made life difficult for all five of them. Uh, and uh, some of them were fighting back. <laughs> Sally Cohen, <laughs> whenever Irene would say something nasty to her, Sally would <laughs> spit right back at her. <laughs> Helen Kramer, on the other hand, would try to duck and dodge <laughs> and, and avoid the, the, this blast. And she'd try to make a joke out of it. or it, 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 it would, it, it, One could write an, a fascinating series of television shows about mm -hmm. that office at that time. Ed Levenberg also tried to avoid, he was, uh, yeah, sure, okay, um, I, I'll look into it, I'll, I'll, I'll fix it up, and he was trying to duck it. Ada Evans, the African-American woman, was also fighting back. <laughs> she, she gave as good as she got. <laughs> she could fight Irene to a standstill. Luther Yancey was, had a, a, t a strategy that was really kind of like um, uh, Ed Levenberg's blended with a little of Ada and, and Sally. Sometimes he would resist and deflect, but he tried to be clever about it. <laughs> he didn't try to confront and fight back, but he tried to deflect it. Um, and I walk into this situation and, and see what's going on. And the first assignment, after you know filling out papers and getting, First assignment, they say, well, we want you to take inventory of the furniture in this office. How is that in the job description of a claims examiner? Well, I just said, this is a test. <laughs> they want to find out something about me. I will, there, were no, there were no fair employment practices, uh, regulations, there was no EEO or anyone to go to. The authority is the people who I got to deal with. I'll do one. So I said, okay, well, give me the last inventory. I said, there's never been an inventory. I mean, this office has been operational since 1935 when Social Security was founded, and you've been getting furniture over the years, over 20 years now. And no one has ever done an inventory. No, they said with a straight face. <laughs> I said, okay, well, um, can I have the help of the, the mail clerk? If he could carry the pad, I'll, because in doing the inventory, they want the federal property registration number. And there's a sticker on, on every chair, every desk, every table, every file cabinet and the little tub file cabinets, each one has a federal sticker, a registration sticker on it. And, and <laughs> so we're talking about roughly 200, 250 pieces of furniture. And the, the sticker, because they came in at different times, the sticker's in a different place. 
uh, you know, you may, three discs came in in 1938. Well, the, the sticker is right here on the, just inside the keyhole desk. But the next one, it's on the back side of the desk. And so yeah. you got to find it every time. And sometimes you've got to get down on your knees and look under the desk, under the drawer. And say, I'll do this, but I'm not going to do it twice. And I don't know what I'll have to do, uh, maybe resign or fight. I don't know. So I got some coveralls. <laughs> and for two days, I, 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 I got my own from home, a data board, a pad, and I did the inventory. And I, incidentally, for better or for worse, they gave me a Cracker Jack secretary, a really bright, sharp girl, white girl, uh, Kathy Mason, just finished Catholic high school. And she was just appalled at this. And she, she tried to give a little moral support and uh, wherever she could. So after I got all this stuff, she helped organize the, 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 the data board and so that she could type it up after I finished. I did a beautiful job, I turned it in. Suddenly I was the golden boy. I couldn't do anything wrong. Uh, I had an intuitive understanding of the clients that came in and an insight into the law. I was really wonderful. In, in every staff meeting, they say, now if you people could do like Wilbur was doing, you know, we'd be okay. I was, it's great. And Irene wanted to have lunch with me. And then I was sent off to Baltimore for training. And while I was away, draft notice came in. <laughs> so, <laughs> meanwhile, I'm dating this girl in Ann Arbor. Um, <laughs> so, that, well, my intention had been to go to graduate school because I'm still corresponding with Marie Cole Berger. Um, and she wants me to go to Johns Hopkins. I don't have any money. <laughs> well, I've got maybe $200. <laughs> and Hopkins is probably going to give me some money, but it's going to be difficult. So the GI Bill, from the Korean GI Bill, had lapsed. But... Congress is in session, they'll pass the new bill. They've got to. So I'll go in the Army. I'll let them take me. I, I call the draft port and she says, well, you got your acceptance. You just show us the acceptance and you got another deferment. Uh, well, I think I'll, I'll, I'll take the GI Bill. So I went to the service and the Army and they sent me to Japan. Um, and I corresponded with this girl in Ann Arbor. Because Marriage is, is a serious undertaking, you know. <laughs> you don't just want to get married. So I went to the Army in Japan and uh, came back. And we corresponded over that time. She wrote amazing. Uh, I got, on average, five letters a week. <laughs> uh, so we decided to get married when I got out of the service. And that's what we did. And I decided to only invite Ada Evans and Luther Yancey, the two black people, to the wedding because I thought the rest of the people in the office would, would not like it because the woman I was marrying was white. <laughs> Which is one of the reasons it took so long to decide to get married. Is this a good idea, a bad idea? You know, how's this going to work out? Is, we're talking about 1958. Some states didn't allow interracial. 27 states. Yeah. It was illegal, including Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, so we got married and had the ceremony, and Luther and Ada came. And uh, they didn't tell anybody in the office, you know, who I got married. But the department, the H-E-W uh, had decided that uh, because I had been away for two years that I ought to get retrained. Uh, not the whole course, but they uh, had me go to um, a, a, a restudy program in Cleveland. Well, um, the ins one of the instructors in Cleveland 
was a woman who had been in the Detroit office before. And um, for whatever reason, I, I, my wife and I decided, uh, the other students in the training program were in, a, were in the hotel rooms. But because my brother had lived in Cleveland and uh, connected us with a family that had an apartment for rent, we had an apartment. So we decided, let's have a, a spaghetti party. And we invited four or five students in the class. And we had. The next morning, the last day of class, when I got to the office, uh, there were three of the students already there who had been at, at the, the, the spaghetti party the night before. They were standing up against the wall like this. And Dorothy, who was, had been the an instructor and had previously been in Detroit, was standing in front of them. You know, to me, it looked I could see through the window, the glass door. It looked like an interrogation. She, and they were looking at her, and they looked up and saw me. <laughs> they, well, when then she realized that they were looking at me, she turned around, stopped whatever she was doing. That was Friday. Monday morning, I go to the office in Detroit. Who's in Detroit? This woman whose who's assignment regular is in Cincinnati, she's in Detroit. And she's over at a desk talking to my supervisor. The supervisor who used to insist that I have coffee with her and sometimes lunch, now suddenly wouldn't speak to me. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that was just the first manifestation of this annoyance at the discovery of who my wife was. The, um, the next came about uh, oh, four months later. Now, I had been in the Army, and I had decided that General George Marshall was right, that the United States was destined to have brush fire wars around the world. So the Korean War was just one. There were going to be others. And that meant that reserves would be called up. And if I got called up, I didn't want to get called back up in the Army. I had seen the Army. <laughs> this is, going into combat with these guys is dangerous. So I wanted to get into the Air Force. And through a lot of deception and ducking and dodging, I got into the Air Force. And so the summer, uh, my reserve time came up with the Air Force reserves. And so I was away for two weeks doing my obligated reserve time. When I returned to the office, discovered that they had gone through all my files, all the interviews I had done with claimants for Social Security, and they called me into a meeting, skipping over a lot of other things they did. They called me into a meeting. They had all my files stacked up on the desk, and the, the manager, the new assistant, because they had added some staff, a new assistant manager, supervisor, assistant were sitting at the end of the table. You sit down there at the end of this table where we normally had our meetings. They took the first one off and says, you know, you don't seem to understand how the system works. You're supposed to get an estimate. You're wrong. You did all of this wrong. You don't understand how people work. You don't understand how the law works. And they, they shove the t file down the, the table, slide down the table. And of course, it opened up and the stuff started to fall on the floor. And they opened up another file and says, you just messed this case up too. And they went on there and finally they said, push the whole pile over on the desk, on the table and said, see if you can't get yourself together and do a decent job around here. <laughs> well, this was late June. Um, I had planned to ask for a leave uh, without pay for two years while I went to grad school. So, so if, if, but uh, the next day, they handed me a memorandum with all of this criticism in it. And then I talked to my friend who just finished law school <laughs> about this. And he says, well, I've heard the civil service has a lawyer to help civil servants who have problems like this. Not an EEO, because that law didn't exist, but just a general. So I went, to, there's a white, young white lawyer. And he understood exactly the problem. He says, well, let's see what the situation is and what we can do. We worked out a plan. He said, well, first of all, what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to, I, I, my intention is to, to ask for leave without pay for two years. He said, well, you can't get that. They would never approve that. But if you resign and in two years apply for reinstatement, it's the same. 
there'd be no difference. So my, my idea was to, um, the, the lawyer recommended to just resign, yes. but you've got to get through August mm -hmm. without any trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, the memorandum that they've written doesn't, coinc doesn't uh, accord with the regulations, mm -hmm. so it has no standing. Mm -hmm. Now when you resign, they will have to collect everything they have about your pay records and so forth and send them to central federal records in St. Louis. And anything that isn't in the file that has been developed in accordance with regulations will be thrown away. And this memorandum that you're concerned about uh, will be thrown away because it, it, doesn't, it wasn't to prepared in accordance with regulations. So don't worry about it. Just stay out of trouble for August, uh, uh, probably for July, and then hand in your resignation on August 1st that you'll be leaving on September 1st because you have a month free. They, they can't do anything to you once you put in your resignation. So that's what I did. Well, he was mistaken. Um, the people down in Federal Records Center, like I guess bureaucrats everywhere, when the file came in, he just put it in the file, everything that was there. So when I graduated from SICE and applied for federal reinstatement, uh, everybody who said, yeah, we'd love to have you. We, you you're just the perfect candidate for us. Uh, we get your records from Federal Records Center and we'll you know, give you a call. Some of them called back and said, we can't hire you. Some of them didn't call at all. When I called them, they said, uh, um, we've got some problems. So I couldn't get reinstated <laughs> because of that memorandum, even though legally they had no standing, I suppose. If I had had a good lawyer, we could have challenged it, but uh, anyway. So then, what did you do after that? Well, um, the placement office sent me over to AFL-CIO and um, made a Springer uh, uh, developed. The, so they were working on a project to open a labor training center in Dakar, Senegal and she thought that would fit me very nicely. And that was going along with something and I was doing research on Dakar. I haven't worked on Africa, but I don't the Middle East, but you know, it's over there. So, so uh, but, um, and again, a rare display of, uh, of, 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 of African unity, um, driven really by the Soviets, they got all of the the unions that they had influence with or control of, and they got everybody, including unions that they didn't control, to have an all-African trade union conference in two days. And they had this conference and they decided they would not accept any bilateral uh, training or, effort or assistance from anybody. Uh, but of course that kill killed the, the labor training center in Dakar. So I went back to the placement office <laughs> And uh, Priscilla Mason there uh, had a, I think was a personal friend, Arnold Steinbach in the International Bureau of Labor Department. And so I went to see him. Uh, and he's very interesting, interesting. Um, he says, uh, we'll get your file and then we'll talk to you. I told him what he could expect to find in the file. So don't worry about it. Well, well, let me read it and then we'll see. So he read it and he says, I read all this crap about her. Uh, of course, I don't believe it, but just in case there's something to it, would you be willing to take a one grade reduction for six months? And if everything goes all right, then we'll bring you back to that grade. Now, in fact, I was eligible for a promotion, <laughs> but he's gonna take me one step back and then bring me back up to zero where I started. And that's what we did. So um, I wanted to know more about the Foreign Service. That's, yes. That's when, when, how did that come about? Well, there I was working at the International Labor Bureau and then they had this, um, this guy in New York who decided he could solve the Arab-Israeli conflict by refusing to unload Arab cargoes and then the Arabs responded by um, by saying they were not going to load or unload any Arab ships, any American ships or cargoes. And the initial American reaction was, what, what does it matter? You know, what do we get from the Middle East? We get, you know, oil, what, skins, 
and uh, I don't know, olive oil, oil, oil. Wait, what about oil? And already they were starting to turn off <laughs> the oil in Saudi Arabia. And so the uh, Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, got together with uh, Arthur Goldberg, Secretary of Labor, and they called a meeting for the weekend in New York with all of the Arab ambassadors to the United Nations. They could get them all together there in New York. And over the weekend, they negotiated a climb down. Goldberg, through um, the International Labor Bureau and the Labor Department, which had contacts in the trade unions, which had, um, well, we had a labor attaché in Beirut. They got everybody to just freeze, don't do anything, and we'll work things out. And I'm told that on the flight back from New York, um, Goldberg said to Rusk, you know, we could avoid this kind of problem if we could reestablish that labor attache position in Cairo. You know, so we have better communication between labor. And Rusk said, well, I don't know about that, but send me over a memorandum on it and give me some names, and I'll talk to my people about it. Well, Goldberg gave it to I, I don't know this, but my presumption is he gave it to the, his assistant secretary for international affairs, who was George L. P. Weaver, under whom I worked, and Weaver sent a memorandum over with my name on it, backed by his his deputy uh, Ed Sylvester, and the department said, okay, <laughs> we won't put him in as labor attaché, but we'll send him in as a political officer with labor responsibilities, and if it works out, then we'll elevate him to a labor attaché. Mm. Wow. And so that's how I went to Cairo. And what year was this? 1964. And you were there for three years? Three years, three until years. the Six Day War. And, and this was under the leadership of, who was? Well, Gamal Abdel Nasser was president, president. throughout the, from beginning to end. He was there when I arrived, and he, mm -hmm. he was still there when I left. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. okay. And then, uh, how, was, how was Egypt? What, what were you? Well, Egypt was in a very bad situation. Their relationships with the United States were, were, were bad. Um, the Dulles brothers, mm -hmm. pardon the reference, um, had become dis, uh, disenchanted with, with Nasser. Um, the Americans had a, offered to build the Aswan High Dam. Now there are two dams in Egypt. There's the Aswan Dam that the British built, but the, the new dam that Nasser wanted to build was the High Dam. And the Americans had said they would build it. And then they started talking to the Egyptians about what was to be done. And the Egyptians wanted it done in a certain way. In addition, Egyptian, Nasser in particular, did not want it to appear that building the high dam, by uh, the Americans building the high dam, was going to obligate him forever to do what we wanted. So he improved relations with the Soviets and started talking to them. And the dullest response was, you know, no, no, you're our boy now. And Nasser said, no. And so Dulles says, well, OK, no high dam. And the Soviets said, we'll build a high dam. And Nasser said, well, I don't know if we want you to build a high dam, but we can finance the construction of the high dam by the revenue from the Suez Canal, which I am now taking. <laughs> so he seized the Suez Canal, which you may remember caused the the British who owned it, uh, mostly, and the French who had a financial interest in it, having built it originally, Ferdinand de Lesseps and all that, <laughs> and the Israelis who were neighboring next door saw an opportunity, and so they invaded Egypt and seized the canal. I don't know if Dulles was not around, but somehow Eisenhower responded unilaterally. Says, the period of colonialism is over. You don't just go in and seize other people's territory like this. Get out. Anthony Eden, he did this with his friend, Anthony Eden. He'd been buddies all during World War II. But the British, French, and Israelis withdrew. 
We, we did it through the United Nations, but the American support for the UN and the Soviets, of course, were happy to see it. And so um, the Israeli Egyptians got their, their Suez Canal back. And in the uh, backwash of that, um, the relationship with the United States is still never really quite recovered. The Egyptians really weren't all that grateful for what Eisenhower had done. Uh, but you had a very good uh, uh, career? Yes. Service? Well, in that job in the Labor Department, uh, as a backup for the Near East Specialists, um, we had a very act USIA had a very active visitor program. They brought foreign leaders from all walks of life to the United States, including labor leaders. Um, they had, um, you know, poets and journalists and uh, movie makers and painters and all kinds of people. But in the labor department, I got to meet uh, labor leaders who came from the Middle East and sit down with my. Uh, my, my counter, my, my, actually, I can't say my boss, but uh, he was the Middle East specialist, and I was his deputy in a sense, although we were in two different bureaus in the in the department. But I met these people. I met uh, the top Egyptian labor leaders in Washington. So when I was designated to go to Cairo, I knew all the key people I needed to know in the labor field. Uh, the Minister of Labor had been a labor leader before. And I, so I had met him and uh, so on. Ahmed Fahim, president of the Confederation. And the leading trade union there was the uh, oil and petroleum workers and the Syed Ali, uh, Ali, uh, Ali, 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 Syed Ali, I had met him. So I, I went there with, with uh, you know, my feet already on the ground. Um, and uh, included in my portfolio was um, internal political affairs, and the, that included the parliament. I arrived in June of 64, and of course I made my contacts at the parliament, and, um, and out of that grew this invitation for the president of the parliament that became so important. Uh, because the president of the parliament, turns out, was Anwar Sadat who was thought to be unimportant because the parliament didn't amount to very much, people thought. But also, there were two vice presidents of the parliament, one of whom I knew, Ahmed Fahim, I had met him in Washington and had followed up with him in Cairo and called on him periodically. The other vice president of the parliament I had not met, um, but uh, a professor, Mauro Berger from Princeton University, traveled through Cairo that summer, and he found the, the ambassador, Bado had resigned and left. The de his deputy was getting ready to leave and so didn't have time to talk to American visitors. And the political counselor who he would have liked to have met was in the States for health reasons. So he was stuck with me. <laughs> and I took him home to lunch and, and then he stayed for dinner. <laughs> and, uh, and at the end of the, all this talk, he says, you know, this has been a very interesting evening. I've enjoyed it because I've been traveling for three months in the Middle East. This is the first time I've been in a home. And I'd like to give you, you know, flowers or wine or something, but I didn't bring anything. But let me give you a contact. He says, the one man I've been in touch with who was active in politics before the Egyptian Revolution in 52, and he's survived and is now active, and still active in politics in here. Now, here's his name. Well, that was in July. Of, in October, Egyptians shot down an unarmed American transport plane over the Delta. It belonged to an oil company. It was flying from Jordan to Libya. Crashed, burned, uh, pilot and co-pilot killed. That's October. On Thanksgiving Day, November, the following month, a mob attacked the American Embassy compound. The American Embassy in Cairo at that time was a, a small tra trapezoid city block that had seven buildings on it. Um, there was the chancery with the political section and the ambassador's office, but there was a marine uh, building for the marine security guard lived. 
and next to it was the uh, USA Library. There was another building for the USA, USAID, USA, but all these seven buildings together made up the embassy. The mob attacked the embassy compound. They came in through the side and burned the marine security residents and the USA library to the ground, it left only ashes, really wiped them out. And now when they shot down the plane, we protested. They accepted the protest, but they didn't apologize. They didn't offer compensation, nothing, they just froze. When they burned down the two buildings in the embassy compound, again, we protested. They accepted the protest, but they didn't apologize, they didn't offer compensation. Again, they just froze. Then, that's October, November, now in December, on what we call, what they call it evacuation day, the day the last British, French, and Israelis withdrew under Eisenhower's order in 50, 56. Um, instead of going to Port Said, the evacuation city, and thanking the Americans for having forced the, instead Nasser gave a speech in which he said, Ambassador Battle called on our supply minister, Kamal Ramsey Stino, and said, if you don't do what we tell you to do, you won't get a new three-year agreement that expires on July, December 31st. And I told the Americans they can drink up the Red Sea. If that's not enough, they can drink up the Mediterranean. In effect, they can go to hell. This was in December. Well, <laughs> we've been kind of busy at the embassy. So in January, finally I got around and ran across this note with this guy's name that Professor Berger had given me. So I called him because he was one of the two vice presidents at the parliament. And they said, well, he, he really rarely comes in here, but he has another job. And here's this number at his other position. He was chairman of the central bank. <laughs> so I called him at the central bank and he said, yeah, he have an appointment the day after tomorrow. I called him on about Thursday or so. And so he gave me an appointment on Sunday. And I went to see him, and he welcomed me. The, the interesting guy, uh, he dressed in a, and he looked like a British country gentleman. He dressed in a, a tweed suit with a vest, you know, and uh, <laughs> very neatly done. Uh, he, we sat down, and he just looked at me. So I said, well, my interest is the parliament. That's one of the things that I cover here. But we've not found anything in Arabic or English on the parliament, its structure or procedure, anything. But we don't even know how many committees there are. We, we know from conversation that there's a president of the parliament and two vice presidents, but that's all. Maybe you can tell me how it operates. He was quiet for a minute, then he turned to me and looked and said, what do we have to do to get a new weed agreement? <laughs> I said, well, that's a very interesting topic. And <laughs> I'm not surprised you raise it, but it's way above my pay grade. Uh, I, I really can't talk to you about that. Um, I, I would guess that I could arrange an appointment with the ambassador for you if you wanted to talk about that. Um, he says, what do we have to do? You have a weed agreement. And I repeated what I had said. And the third time he asked, what do we have to do? I said, well, let me make a proposal. Um, I want to talk, I want to hear from you about the parliament. I have some ideas, I have an opinion on the question you raise, but I have no, I don't have a brief, I can't discuss that, it's way outside my purview. But I can tell you, you know, what I think, if it's just between you and me. He says, hmm. <laughs> do, do in Iran, do they say, meaning no? Yeah, you know. well, he didn't say, but he no, said, hmm, yeah. you know. So I took that as a okay. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, first of all, two months ago, I was in the town of Edfu, where there is a new factory that processes sugarcane pulp into craft paper. It's a new technology developed by the Americans, and there are only two other plants like it in the world. It's, and it's a gift, it, it's not a loan. It's a gift of the American people to the people of Egypt. But the American engineers who have built that plant, put equipment in, set it into operation, have been there for over a year. 
because no one from the Egyptian government will accept ownership or title. They can't leave until they turn it over to somebody. So he said, what do we have to do? I said, well, the president of the republic ought to go to Edfu and have a big ceremony and thank on international radio and television the American people for this gift. And he got a pad out and started writing. I said, now this is just between you and me. He said, yeah, 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 well, what else? I said, well, trans accept ownership of this factory and, and thank the American people for it. So he said, okay, what else? I said, well, you know, you shot down an unarmed American <laughs> transport plane <laughs> and you, have an, you need to apologize. You need to give us access to the crash site. You need to turn over the bodies of the pilot and co-pilot. What else? <laughs> well, I mean, these are the kinds of things that need to be done, but there are other things. What else? I said, well, you know, you, you burned down two buildings, the American embassy. <laughs> you, you burned down the library and the Marine security guard residence. You, you need, A, you need to apologize. B, you need to offer compensation. And as it happens, the embassy is, you know, is in Garden City, the section of the city. And we have noticed that there are 16 sequestered mansions that you have seized from wealthy Egyptians that are unoccupied, any one of which we think would make a pretty good library. So you could, you know, offer us one of those libraries, one of those uh, mansions. I said, what else? I said, well, those are the kinds of things that you need to, to do. And, you know, implicitly have some ceremonies in which, you know, you apologize for the insults that the, the, the president made on December, back in December. I said, okay. And then he stood up and put out his hand. And it was an odd thing to do, but I, he had his hand out, so I, I thought he wanted to shake my hand, so I shook his, took his hand and shook, and he pulled me up off the seat. And now, if he had been, you know, equal in rank or inferior in rank, I might have said, you know, I'm going to stay in. <laughs> but this is the chairman of the central bank. <laughs> I can't fight with him in his office. So he pulled me up off the seat. He pulled me to the door of his office, opened the door, pushed me through it. And as he's closing the door in my face, he says, I shall report your conditions to the president. <laughs> so... I went back, this is a Sunday afternoon. I, I, I drove straight to the embassy, I was in my own car. I drove to the embassy and I called my boss, Don Burgess, who had, had come back from medical leave in the States. And Burgess says, what? And what did he say? And what did you say? And then what, what else did you say? Then he said, wait, you just stay there, I'm coming in. <laughs> so he drove in from the suburbs and we went over the whole thing, word for word. And he says, I think we better call the ambassador. So we call the ambassador on a Sunday afternoon. And he comes in, you know, his polo shirt, and he says, well, what have we got? And he says, I think you better listen to this. And he had me go over the whole thing, word for word, the whole conversation. And who is this guy again? I said, he's the chairman of the central bank. I said, does he have access to Nasser, just like that? I said, well, yeah, I head of the central bank can call the president of the republic anytime he wants. And you think he did? Yeah, well, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I said, well, how do we handle it? Well, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, Nasser might say, go to hell or again. And so, but we have to report it in case, you know, it evolves in a positive way or a negative way. But the Washington needs to know that this conversation took place and it has the potential to throw us off in a new direction. So, that's what we did. I sent in a, a routine, we sent in a routine report. That was on Sunday. On Monday, on Tuesday, I got a call from my friend Said Mare, and he, they wanted me to, his, not from him, from his secretary, and I got to his office, and when I got to the entrance to the, his suite, <laughs> I could see him already through the glass door and he was holding his door open in his inner office. And I walked straight through, his, his secretary stood up and smiled, and I went into his office, he closed the door behind me and he says, the president accepts your conditions. Oh my God. <sighs> yeah. Is that good or bad for me? <laughs> so I would cut it short and I got back in, my, in the embassy car, chauffeur car, and back to the embassy. 
And I went straight to the ambassador's office. Well, they had already started it. The air attache had contacted the embassy, ambassador's office to say, they've called me up and they want to turn over the bodies and arrange a visit to the crash site. So everything we wanted, they've offered to do. Then the cultural attache called and says, they want to make an appointment to go around and visit the mansions in Garden City to pick out one to be a library. And they had called the AID counselor of embassy to say, when can we arrange to have a ceremony in Edfu? To, so they were, they were preempting everything. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> so we're going to finish. And I just, four minutes. Do you have anything to tell the younger generation of African Americans? Well, the Foreign Service is an interesting life. Um, I enjoyed my time in it. And I'm glad I did it. Um, I've learned a lot of things uh, in the service, but a lot since I left the Foreign Service. Uh, it does seem to me that there are two reasons, principally two reasons for going to the Foreign Service. One, you're interested in policy and you'd like to have some understanding and possibly influence on it. Another is you're just interested in the adventure. And if you're interested in policy, I would suggest that you get an advanced degree. And a master's is good, but I think a doctorate really is what you want to do. And you want to follow the course of Henry Kissinger and, I um, can't think of his name, but uh, Carter's National Security Advisor. In other words, you want to become, you might spend some time in the Foreign Service, but you want to get advanced degree experience and travel in the world. Zerbinski, yes. Yes, um, that's the way, the path to foreign policy influence. Or on the Hill, um, staff work with the, uh, either the House Foreign Affairs Committee or the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, or working for one of the senators or congressmen who is on one of those committees is the way to get access to policy. Or one of the nonprofit organizations in Washington that does research on foreign policy. Um, or you might want to do a, a, some of both. But the Foreign Service is, is, can be very, very interesting. If you're female, um, you want to look carefully at the world. While uh, America hasn't made a lot of progress in accommodating women, uh, I think we are far ahead of just about every other country in the world, with the exception of the Scandinavian countries. So life can be a little bit tricky or difficult for a woman, um, even as an American official in most of the rest of the world. Um, just moving around the city can be, in some cities, problematic. Uh, but interesting. <laughs> so I, I recommend it uh, as, 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 a, as a life if those two areas of life interest you. Nothing about racism? Anything about well, um, I think the department has a long way to go still. Okay. And um, I, I got tripped up twice in the Foreign Service. I told you a story about my life in the Civil Service. Well, I got tripped up two more times in the Foreign Service by, still yes, you run into, uh, one individual can do an enormous amount of harm mm -hmm. if they make up their mind they want to damage or destroy your life or career. And I, I took, fortunately, I survived long enough to get old enough to uh, take early retirement, which I did, um, which turns out in many ways to have been a benefit. Uh, um, it's not the path that I would have preferred, but it worked out and um, I survived and I'm rather comfortable in many ways.